My son asked me to make him a bed. Now he loves video games and Star Wars, so using these as inspiration, I made a live edge and epoxy headboard, shaped some futuristic legs, busted my drum sander, made some smoke, and tried to make him the best video game Star Wars inspired bed I could, with a little surprise he didn't know was coming. So shortly after my son asked me to build him this bed, I was at my local lumber yard, Groff's Lumber, and the way that I design furniture is not what you see a lot on YouTube. You see a lot of folks who jump onto SketchUp and they create these amazing, elaborate designs, and they know going into their build exactly what they're going to do. For me, it's a little bit different. I kind of start to get a general idea, and then I sort of wing it as I go along. And this was definitely a case of winging it because I was walking through the lumber yard and I spotted this cherry slab. And if you notice that portion of the slab there where there was some bark inclusion, it reminded me of the Pillars of Creation, which if you've never seen that, uh, it's a galaxy or something, some photograph that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And it all of a sudden dawned on me. He really likes Star Wars. And this is a spacey kind of looking thing to me. For whatever reason, that's just what it reminded me of. So I went ahead and impulse bought it. Now, I decided I didn't want it to be a perfectly live edge headboard. I did want it to have some structure. So I went ahead and decided to do an epoxy pour. Now, I am by no means an epoxy expert. Uh, I do not routinely make river tables and stuff like that. And I think there are plenty of great resources out there online where you can learn about how to do these things properly. But I've certainly made my fair share of epoxy stuff in the past. I've made epoxy river tables, and I'm happy to share with you guys a couple of things that I have learned. Now, first, I'm using this deep pour epoxy resin to start with to kind of skim coat the slab. And this is going to do a couple things for me. Number one, I know that I'm going to be staining the epoxy black when I pour the river portion of this. And I don't want that staining, especially with cherry. Cherry has a very high risk of staining and bleed through with any kind of pigment and stain. So it's nice because it seals that, but it does something else that's really helpful. That edge, that live edge that you're gonna pour the epoxy in between, if you don't seal that with something, a lot of times while the epoxy is curing, you will get these micro bubbles that form and those can come to the surface while the epoxy is curing. You don't wind up seeing it until it's too late. And so this is just another way to kind of protect against those and get the best epoxy pour possible. Now I'm using this super clear liquid glass deep pour epoxy. I am not sponsored, but one cool tip that I've learned is that if you puncture a hole, almost like shotgunning a beer in these bottles, man, it flows out so much faster than easier and you don't have to deal with the splashing glug glug of the bottle. Now this liquid glass, this is the first time I'm using it. A bunch of other epoxy river table YouTubers use this stuff. So I thought that I would give it a try and see what all the hype is about. Now the really nice thing with this is you can pour up to four inches with it apparently. I'm not pouring anywhere near that. But the reason I wanted to try this is because it has a very low viscosity, which means it is going to flow really smooth and easy. It's going to penetrate and it's going to really soak in. So a thicker, higher viscosity epoxy, it's tough to fill some of these small cracks. And this slab certainly had a bunch of really small cracks that really needed to be stabilized. So I decided to give this a try. The other thing that I heard was really nice about it is that you don't really have to worry about bubbles because it takes, you know, 18 to 24 hours before it even starts to firm up. And then another day or two after that until it really cures. So any bubbles that you do get in theory really should come to the top of the surface. And you can see I really wasn't worried about that in my pour. I didn't do any kind of like vacuum container to try to get all the bubbles to the top. And really, every time you see me using a butane torch to pop these bubbles, it's more just for you guys to watch and have fun because it is really, really satisfying. However, completely unnecessary. So with a two day cure ahead of it, at least it was time to start working on the legs while the headboard did its thing. Now I wanted to show you guys sometimes when you're in a small garage shop like this, you have to get creative with your space and this bandsaw is no exception. These are almost eight foot long boards 
and it takes a lot of wrangling to get them cut, but I really do prefer to rough cut my boards on the bandsaw first and then head over to the miter saw. Now I'm using cherry for all of this. I am a big fan of cherry and this is eight quarter cherry that I'm working with. If you don't know what eight quarter means, it's a way of measuring wood that refers to the thickness of it in quarters. So an inch would be four quarters, two inches would be eight quarters and so on. This is all eight quarter as I mentioned and so I do a rough milling first where I broke everything down and then I actually let it sit in the shop for a day or two because you want to see if things move. These boards were up to 12 inches wide, so especially when you hit these at the bandsaw, cut them down to near their final length, they do move a little bit. So next step, once they were rough cut to their length, was to get them over to the joiner to get a flat face on them. And milling is really one of my favorite parts of woodworking. It's interesting because I've heard a lot of people say they really don't enjoy milling. There's something about it for me that's very satisfying, almost more satisfying than even the finishing process where you've got this rough looking wood and all of a sudden you get to break it down and start to see what's underneath all that rough exterior and it's when the project really starts to take shape. Now again, I had previously mentioned that I really didn't have a plan for this and I'm kind of winging it and I had a general idea of how I wanted the legs to be. Now at the foot of the bed, I didn't want a tall footboard. I wanted the feet to go ahead and be flushed with the stringers, with the length and the width of the bed. But then obviously I knew the headboard needed to be tall enough to accommodate the headboard. And then on top of that, I had a cabinet that my son already had in his room for under the bed that I had to make sure this all fit with. So I was working with some good general measurements as I milled this all up. And in the day or two while I was letting these boards rest after the initial milling process, I started to do some more research. Again, knowing that my son likes video games and Star Wars, so I started searching for some stuff and I looked at video game brands and I started to notice that a bunch of the brands that make video games have these sort of sharp and rounded angles in them. And then I went and started looking at Star Wars stuff and I looked at an AT-AT walker and I noticed hey, look again, there's all these rounded angles. And then same thing, of course, popped up a picture of a TIE fighter. Sure enough, you've got a bunch of these really angular looking things, but they're also rounded off, so they're not perfectly sharp. So as I started to glue these legs up, the main theme going through my head was rounded angles. And hopefully you'll see that this will all make sense later on. So trying to save some clamps, I'm gluing everything up all in one go here. And the two pieces that have a double section at the bottom and then a thinner single section at the top, that's going to be the headboard. And then the legs there are going to be just the small size. They're going to be nice and flush with the actual stretchers. And again, I was thinking about this design as it was going along. And this is one of the really cool things about woodworking is being able to take something that is in your head, look at a block of wood and say, I'm going to make that. So on the first round of milling, I made sure that everything was thicker than I needed it to be, wider than I needed it to be, because anytime you're making legs, there is this secondary process of making them your final thickness and squaring them up. So I wanted to make sure two faces were nice and square, so I started at the joiner, made sure I did this with both the lower legs as well as the top legs, and then we're going to head over to the planer next. Now, if you notice here, this is the width and then this is the height. And there's a couple different ways that I could take this excess material off. One of the more obvious ways would be, let's say, go over to the table saw and take that off. I could also go to the band saw. These were pretty thick legs. They were pushing the height of my table saw blade. So that wasn't really an option. And with the band saw, you always run the risk of drift and then you still have to finish it on something. So a couple passes through the planer and that made nice quick work of it and we had nice squared up legs. So my reference surface when I go to put the hardware in for this bed is going to be referencing off the top of the stretchers. And again, I knew that the top of the stretchers were gonna be flush with the top of the legs at the foot of the bed. So I had to make a way to make the feet match up with the headboard portion of the leg at the top and you just saw me doing that. 
at the miter saw. And now is where all of this design happens. Again, there's definitely people out there who are super good with SketchUp and probably could have done this on there. But for me, I like to draw everything out with a pencil, take a look at it. I can erase if I need to and look around at it, put it all together, how it's going to stand. And it gives me that final idea of, yeah, this is what I want to have happen. And this is how I want this to look. So again, these legs are pretty thick. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can cut a taper. Now, I do have a woodpecker's tapering jig, but unfortunately, these legs were just too big for it. So I decided to work with John here. And John is my quick do-it-yourself makeshift tapering jig. I'm going to set up a couple blocks of wood just to make this nice and repeatable. I matched this piece of scrap plywood up to the line that I had drawn. And you can see why I make that squiggly line for the waist. I want to make sure I'm cutting the right portion off. Now you can see what I'm talking about here with the height of my table saw. With this jig, I'm not gonna be able to cut all the way through. And again, you could cut this taper on a bandsaw and I will show you how I'm doing this here in a second, but I thought this would be a way to give me a nice clean result without having to do bandsaw then joiner or a hand planer or sander or anything like that. So this jig wound up working really well. I went ahead and used double-sided tape every time just to make sure everything was nice and firmly stuck and things cut really well. And now, as with any jig, let's have a moment of silence for John, the makeshift tapering jig. Once I had recovered from having to get rid of John the tapering jig, it was time to finish off these tapers that he so graciously started. So you can see now step two of this strategy where I started at the table saw. I then go to the band saw and use the table saw cut line as a guide for my cuts. Now I did have one taper on each leg that I couldn't cut at the table saw, so I had to do those freehand. But it's nice to be able to do this. Now it's important if you are going to use this technique you need to make sure that you are not running your bandsaw blade right up against the smoothly cut face from the table saw because I'm going to need that here in a second. And I took these over to the router table and I used this flush trim bit. So again, this is just one method of doing this. You could cut the tapers directly at the bandsaw and then either use a hand plane, a hand sander, or even a joiner to get these tapers nice and smoothed out. Now I get asked a lot between videos here on YouTube and on other social media channels such as our Instagram page, what kind of tools I'm using and almost every video I post there's a question about what are you using here, what are you using there, and if you are interested, we have an Amazon storefront where everything that you buy from that actually helps us out a little bit and sends a commission our way from each purchase, and I've tried to organize them in a lot of different categories. So. If you are interested in any of the tools that you see in this video, there's going to be a link down to the Amazon storefront down in the description below. And if you do want to buy anything from that, we'd really appreciate it. It helps us out quite a bit. Now, as I mentioned, on each leg, I had one of these tapers that I could not cut using the table saw, bandsaw, router table method. And especially here at the headboard portion of things, I knew that this was going to be really tricky, so what I decided to do for these two is use this flush trim bit. You can see, again, I just set a piece of scrap plywood right up against that line, cut the flush trim bit down as far as I could, and then took it over to the router table to finish off. Now, for the free-handed tapers on the feet, I decided to go a little bit more old school and use a hand plane, and I really think it's important to be able to be a hybrid woodworker. And if the sweet, soothing sounds of a hand plane going through cherry can't convince you that working with hand planes is nice, let me explain to you why. I think there are certain things that are just a lot easier to do when you do use hand tools. And that's what I mean when I say a hybrid woodworker. This is a term that I first heard used by Mark Spagnolo, and it makes a lot of sense. Using power tools for big jobs, for repetitive jobs, wherever possible, 
but then also using hand tools, especially in areas where you need some finesse. And for instance, with that headboard angle that I had cut, I had to freehand cut that at the bandsaw and the mortise for how I'm going to put the headboard into those two legs is referencing off of that front edge. So I wanted both of those front edges to be exactly perfectly flush. So all I had to do was set my pieces down with the back down on the table and then use the hand plane to make them perfectly flush and smooth. And it leaves a beautiful surface. Now you can see here what I'm starting to go for with this concept of rounded angles. I took all of these legs and each leg has three tapers on it total. And then I put a chamfer on each corner. Now chamfers on the surface seem to be very squared off, but especially when you start to sand a chamfer and if you start to round that over a little bit, it creates that rounded angular look that I was going for. And that's how I wanted everything to look. I wanted the edges to be these rounded angles. I wanted my tapers to be kind of rounded off and not super sharp. And so I was left with this really cool looking leg after I was done. So we are starting the assembly process here, taking the legs and I'm using the domino to put this together. Now, this is another really cool tool that you can find in our Amazon store. It's from DFM USA. And if you've ever worked with a domino before, the tenons themselves, especially for dry fits, can get stuck. It's a pain. You wind up having to get a wrench to yank them out. And then you're like, oh, do I need to get another one? Some people say, use a block plane, use some sandpaper, sand them off. This tool makes it super simple. I had to use a bunch of dominoes for this project. I had this stretcher at the foot and then another stretcher up at the head, each of which required six dominoes. So being able to clean these up in a batch way was really nice and I'd highly recommend you check that out if you are a domino user. Now it's really important as you go through a project, don't throw your scraps away until the project is done. And this is a perfect example this outside taper on the feet was going to make it almost impossible to clamp these. And so saving my off cuts was great because once everything was smoothed up, I was able to use some CA glue and masking tape to make myself some clamping calls. And I use this process a lot. I build a lot of furniture with angles and it always works really well. So it's really important. Make sure you save your off cuts. Now that the legs were starting to take shape and some sub-assemblies were coming together, it was time to come back to the headboard and demold this thing. And the mold spray that I used worked really well. I had no trouble getting this thing out of the mold. And you could see I had no trouble getting those clamping calls off either. Now when it came time to surface and flatten this, I thought, no trouble, I'll do it myself on the drum sander. That's fine. I was glad I was wearing my brown pants that day. So turns out that this is a dual head drum sander and the back drum, for whatever reason, the sandpaper just ripped in the middle of this operation made that loud, scary popping sound. I thought for sure something had blown, like the drum sander itself was broken. Fortunately, it was just a matter of taking that off, putting a new one on, and then I made sure to be extra careful when surfacing this. I took super, super light passes. So after getting that face sanded down, it was time to take this thing out of a mold completely. And if you've ever made an epoxy table of any sort, this is the most nerve wracking part. Such a sweet, sweet sound. So of all the tables that I've ever made, I always use that mold release spray with melamine for my epoxy forms. And I've always had really good luck with it. As long as you follow the directions and use it correctly, you wind up being able to get these things out of their molds pretty easily. Once I had everything all surfaced and flattened on both sides, it was time to cut the headboard itself to final dimensions. So I started out using the track saw on one long edge and then took it over the table saw where you can see I made a bunch of snow or grated cheese or cut epoxy, whatever it is. Now there's three ways that you can make a square edge here. One, you could just take a square, draw a line and run your track saw right along that line. Option number one. Option two is use your square itself to actually run up against the track. That'll give you a nice square cut as well. Or for option number three, you can get one of these commercially available track squaring devices. This one happens to be from TSO, 
not the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, but the company that makes woodworking stuff. All three of those options will give you a nice square cut off of a reference surface. Now, one of the tricky things for me about furniture design is I spend a lot of time thinking about all the different options that I have for how I'm going to put stuff together. And this headboard was one that I thought about for quite some time. How was I going to get this thing into these headboard legs while still accounting for the possibility of wood movement? Now, obviously, there's epoxy in this headboard, so is that really going to have a lot of movement to it? I don't know. It's a slab. Slabs move quite a bit. And so there were a lot of different ways that I thought I could do this, but the best way that I could think was to make this almost like a breadboard end on a tabletop. So what I'm going to do is cut tenons into the headboard itself. And then as you can see here on that diagonally cut front surface of the headboard leg, I'm using a router with an edge guide and taking multiple small passes to go ahead and cut a mortise to the same thickness. And hopefully now it makes sense why I wanted to use the hand plane to make sure that these surfaces were perfectly equal because if one of these mortises was cut a little bit farther back or deeper in, that was going to cause all sorts of alignment trouble when I went for the final glue up. Now, another one of my favorite things about woodworking is the fact that it allows you to make solutions to try to figure out how to make something repeatable and accurate. And that satisfies me at a very deep level. So when I was making the tenons here on the headboard, I had to make sure they were the same distance in from the edges. And the reason for that is twofold. Number one, I'm trying to match the stringer that's gonna go across the bottom in terms of the width. And then number two, I don't want the distance to be off from the front and the back on each side. So I wound up making some test pieces and cut this piece of plywood out to the exact width. So all I had to do was align it with the top and the bottom and one edge of the headboard. And then I could run my router right up against that to get a nice, perfect flush cut. And as you can see, fist bumps. It worked out really, really well, and I was able to get everything lined up perfectly. Now, I mentioned a couple times that the design for this was inspired by video games and Star Wars, and I'm curious to know what your favorite Star Wars movie is. Now I know, this is very polarizing. A lot of people have a lot of very hard opinions about this. Personally, I'm an Empire Strikes Back person. That's my favorite one in the franchise. My son, who I'm making the bed for, is actually a big episode three fan. He thinks Revenge of the Sith is his favorite one, and I respect him for that, and I respect the fact that he went with a uh, prequel trilogy uh, as his favorite. Um, it hurts me in some ways, but that's okay. We all have our opinions, and that's fine. So I'm curious to know from you, what is your favorite Star Wars movie? Let me know down in the comments. It'll let me know that you watched all the way to this point in the video. And if you did watch all the way to this point in the video, then maybe you're a pretty awesome person who is wondering how you might be able to support me otherwise. Well, I appreciate that. And it's funny you should ask. So we just started a Patreon. And at the moment, I have one level. It is a $5 level, and that gets you access to monthly patron only videos and the rest of it I want to leave up to you the potential patrons so I've actually got a public poll that's out there right now and it asks all sorts of questions like what might you want in a patreon offering do you want meet and greets Q and A's all that kind of stuff so head over to the link down in the description for patreon I would love it even if you're not going to be a member right now if you might take that poll and let me know what are some things you might like to see out of a Patreon membership? And if you are interested, would love to have you as a Patreon member. We're going to start sharing some exclusive content next month in February. And if you're not interested, I'm just happy you're here. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. So we've gotten to the point where I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And no, that smoke is not a problem. That's just what happens when a kind of dull router bit goes into end grain cherry. What I did was make a little jig here to be able to install all of the hardware. So I'm using some pretty standard bed mounting hardware for this that I bought on Amazon. And the important thing with these is you don't want them to be too deep in. You want them to really sit just flush with the surface. And so I made this jig out of some scrap plywood. 
These things have little indentations on the back that when you hit them with a hammer, it lets you know where those indentations sit so I can route out some relief holes here with my drill. You could use a router. I'm sure there's other fancier ways to do this, but I found the drill to be incredibly effective and it got a really nice tight fit. And I think one of the things that's a theme that you can see throughout this whole video is that making custom furniture a lot of times involves a lot of jig making, a lot of problem solving, and a lot of solutions as to how you're gonna do this. And if you wind up making multiple pieces of this furniture, then these things are great. But if not, if you're doing a one-off like I am, then it's a one-time jig. But they worked really well, and these things fit like a glove. Now, you noticed before that I used screws to attach the headboard, and I am not a big fan of leaving any sort of exposed hardware. So what I did here was I used a plug cutting bit at the drill press to knock out some of these plugs that match the diameter of the recess that I cut on the outside. And I tried as best I could to match the grain up. Again, this is why you save your offcuts until you're done a project, because you really just never know when you're gonna need them. So glued these in and I think it left a pretty good result. I was able to get a pretty decent match. And as you can see, the bed is really starting to take shape and it is super exciting at this point. Now you may be looking at that headboard and thinking, man, I hope this guy thought about wood movement. And I absolutely did think about wood movement. So as you saw me screwing those in, when I made the holes for each screw, the top and the bottom hole got elongated so that if there was wood movement, there could be some movement. And I cut the tenon shorter than I cut the mortise. So there should be no problem with wood movement on this headboard over time. It's got room to move. Now those pieces that you just saw me install on the long stretchers there are going to hold the strips that I'm going to use to make the platform for the mattress itself. This is a twin bed, so I really shouldn't need much more than that for support. Now one of the things I've started doing that has really changed the way that I finish furniture is using this raking light. So whenever I go for my final finish sanding, I turn all the lights off in the shop, I set up this raking light, and I use that, and it really helps you see all of the deficiencies that you otherwise wouldn't pick up until you started putting finish on. And speaking of finish, you've seen me use Rubio Monocoat before in other builds, you've seen me use guitar oil in the last build, and I'm going with a spray-on finish here. This is a water-based urethane called Endurovar made by a company, General Finishes. And again, I'm not sponsored by any of these companies, but I really like this finish. It is water-based, it is eco-friendly and environmentally safe, apparently. And I was fortunate enough, I was doing this in December, and we randomly got a day where it was like in the 50s. So I was able to take that and use this outside. Now, the first coat when you spray this on, because it's water-based, is going to pop the grain. I've tried water popping before I put this finish on. It still pops the grain, and I find you have to go back and do a rough sand with 220 grit sandpaper, and I like to do that with this orbital sander. It takes down the water pop, and it also takes off any orange peel whatsoever. And between the second and third coats, there's really not that much roughness. You just need a 320 grit furniture pad that you just kind of lightly scuff it down with. And this is a great finish. And if you work out of a garage or small workspace, I would really encourage you not to be intimidated by spray on finishes. There are some great finishes out there. And I gotta be honest with you, I really prefer the look of this to even some of the hard wax oils that I've used. It just leaves a really nice sheen. So this thing is all finished. And I mentioned that I had a little surprise for my son that he wasn't expecting. So yes, LEDs. He was really excited about this. Now, I wanted to make that epoxy a little bit translucent so that you could see the LED lights behind it. Made me think of R2-D2 a little bit. Um, and it's programmable. You can set it to Alexa. You can use an app and change it to all sorts of different colors and do all sorts of different programming. He's got his gaming chair there, his LED keyboard. And I think this all just matches up really well. Now I mentioned that I was gonna put some slats in for support and I got some scrap white oak and ash that I had, made some slats and screwed them into those support pieces there and it's more than enough 
for a twin bed for support. And as we're going through all these shots here, hopefully you can see what I kept talking about with rounded angles, with the tapers, the chamfers, and the scuff sanding, and kind of everything coming together really makes me think of those TIE fighters, those ATAT -AT walkers, the angles that I see on his gaming chair, and it just turned out really well, and I'm super happy about it. So if you feel like I earned your subscription, I would love to have you follow along. Subscribe to the channel. Can't wait to show you what I've got in store for my next build, and I think I better get out of here before I get lightsabered. Catch you on the next one.